So thanks everybody for coming uh, this afternoon in person and on Zoom. This is wonderful. Dan, so good to see you. It's been years. I'm seeing people in the flesh for the first time in, in years. Uh, so um, uh, thank you. I, I'm Tim Paglione, Chair of Earth and Physical Sciences, and I'm welcoming you to the um, Spurgle Lecture Series, our, our uh, third, third installment of the Spurgle Lecture Series. We've now, we're now completing the cycle through the sciences uh, in honor of, of Marty Spurgle, who was the chair for 19 years of natural sciences. Uh, we, we started with a physics presentation and moved on to a, a biology presentation. And today it's chemistry, pharmaceutical sciences. Um, and then, so we're gonna go back to physics in case people are wondering, or maybe geology. So, uh, so today's speaker I'm very excited to introduce is uh, Dr. Steve Proja. Um, Steve Progen is a principal at Beat the Reaper, LLC. Previously, he served as a senior vice president of R&D in the Infectious Diseases and Vaccines Innovation Medicines Unit at MedImmune, uh, where he led the strategy, prioritization, and advancement of the company's infectious disease and vaccine portfolio. Prior to MedImmune, Dr. Projan served as vice president and global head of infectious diseases at the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research. He previously spent 15 years at Wyeth in roles of increasing responsibility. Uh, most recently as Vice President of Biological Technologies. He holds a BS from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, as well as an MA and PhD from Columbia University. Um, and before Steve uh, comes up to the podium, I just wanna uh, let everyone know uh, that this year's uh, Martin Spurgle lecture is uh, somewhat special because as most, most of you may be aware, uh, Marty sadly passed away last September. Um, so we're having a, a bit of a memorial as well. So please stay and join us for the reception after the talk. Uh, it's, it's right on the other side of the wall here. And uh, we'll also share some remembrances uh, at, at that time. And um, so uh, please stay for that. Hope you can all join us. So without further ado, Steve. Well, uh, thank you very much, Tim. Um, I also want to thank uh, my old colleague, uh, Deb Chakravarti, for uh, hatching this plot to get me to speak here. And uh, let's get to it. So uh, as I always like to point out, uh, my opinions are my own opinions and may or may not reflect uh, the opinions of those I work with or live with. And one of the people who's on the Zoom is my wife, so I have to behave myself sort of. So disclosures. I'm a former employee and share, current shareholder of AstraZeneca, a member of uh, the Avaxion Board of Directors, that's a Danish biotech company using artificial intelligence to design vaccines. I'm a scientific advisory board member, investor in Virion and some other smaller companies. I've consulted with a variety of organisms, or, organisms organizations and uh, some of which haven't even paid me yet, but that's besides the point. Uh, I formed a limited uh, liability, limited leasing uh, company called Beat the Reaper based on an old George Carlin routine. And I was stunned to find out it was neither trademarked nor copyrighted. So I decided to appropriate it. Uh, I do lots of reviews for a variety of organizations and journals. Um, I try not to be nasty in writing reviews, although usually when someone gets a nasty review, they automatically think it's me who wrote the review. Uh, Miliana Nessen, uh, my wife of 36 plus years, uh, who's a leading authority on maternal immunizations, uh, agrees with me almost none of the time. And, uh, but we do have very engaged scientific discussions. And I have uh, worked on a variety of coronavirus projects, uh, some of which I'll probably discuss, uh, but I have not accepted any payment for any of that work because uh, I wanted to get back into restaurants as fast as possible. So you've heard about something called the big lie. And is it election fraud? Not really. It's quote, we never saw this coming, meaning the pandemic. And why is that the big lie? Well, I'll elaborate. This are scenes from around New York City and parts south uh, around March of 2020. 
you might recognize the uh, distinguished looking gentleman next to a significantly heavier myself. I've managed to lose 30 pounds during the pandemic. At the bottom is uh, two slides of uh, what was going on in New York. You know, something called Samaritan's Purse uh, pitched a bunch of, bunch of tents across the street in Central Park from Mount Sinai. And there's the hospital ship. And I don't remember if it's the Comfort or the Mercy that came into New York. Uh, what you do see is directly behind uh, our apartment building, uh, a, a ramp leading up into a refrigerator truck where the bodies were stored uh, during the first phases of the pandemic in New York City. And there's the statue of Abraham Lincoln appropriately masked uh, in front of the New York uh, Historical Society. So March 20, 2020, uh, I was asked the following question from Dr. Fauci. Steve, what do you think is going to happen? And I said, Dr. Fauci, the excrement is going to hit the rotating device. And it did. I still remember when, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, 50,000. We're only going to see 50,000 deaths. And when I saw that, I immediately posted, we're going to be lucky to keep it under 200,000. And we're not going to get lucky. And you know what's happened. Very soon, we will hit a million deaths from this pandemic. Didn't have to happen. So coronaviruses are very common among mammals. Uh, SARS came from civets. That's pretty certain. MERS from camels. That's Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Don't kiss your camel. And strangely, some people do. Uh, they were examples of zoonotic transmission, something jumping from an animal to humans and becoming contagious. But why didn't SARS and MERS become pandemic like uh, SARS-CoV-2? Came out of Wuhan, China, probably a bad origin. We would have been able to, uh, to know this better, but there was a proposal coming out of the uh, NCATS, the new translational science portion of the NIH, to actually determine the viral viral genome sequences that can be found in a variety of mammalian species, especially in China. But that got shot down by the Trump administration. So lab leak, in my opinion, total garbage. So R0, uh, most of you should now have heard of that parameter. It's, you know, why is the magic number one? Well, if that number exceeds one, it means you will get exponential human to human transmission. And that's exactly what we saw from the original SARS-CoV-2, which had an R0 uh, of 2.5 to 3.5. So you can see it is more contagious. It was more contagious than the flu. Subsequent variants are even showing a greater degree of contagion. And you can see flu also spreads exponentially, but its R0 is only 1.2. And that's for you know, not every single strain of flu is gonna have the same parameter, but many do stick around that point. But part of the reason why flu is not as apparently transmissible is we've all had considerable exposure to influenza, as well as many of us getting vaccinated with the flu on an annual basis. We do see the most transmission in congregate settings where people are not protected, bars, restaurants, gyms, uh, political rallies, uh, and all of this is kind of loosely based on cell phone data. We don't do a great job of tracing and tracking here in the United States. And I can tell you that I had a high school reunion last August. It was 50 plus one, we delayed it a year. And even though uh, most people, I think all people were vaccinated, it became a super spreader event with over 40 people testing positive. And that's not smart because we were all mostly 69 back then and some not in great physical shape. Who is doing the spreading? Well, mostly it's gonna be asymptomatic people or pre-symptomatic people, people who do not wear masks. That's why Abe Lincoln was not a super spreader himself. A report that 86% of infected patients are symptomatic is probably inaccurate. It's certainly far lower now 
with uh, variants like you know, BA2, BA4, BA5 now spreading, where many of the people who test positive have not really displayed any symptoms. So how many people have actually been infected? Well, this figure is now probably inaccurate. In the US, it was reported last week that 60% of adults tested positive for antibodies to SARS, you know, that are active against SARS-CoV-2. And that's actually using a testing system that doesn't detect antibodies towards the spike protein, which is what the vaccines are formatted to target, which means that that 60% number means that's the natural level of exposure in the general population. It's actually 75% among kids who have obviously had a lot of exposure you know, to, to the virus in their congregate settings. Yep, Benjamin Franklin, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. The older you get, the sicker you get from this virus. Part of the reason for that is that your immune system wanes. You don't mount an appropriate immune response at a short enough period of time. Uh, it's also true for influenza. That's where we see most of the deaths in influenza are from people above 60 live. And that's certainly true for SARS-CoV-2. And you can, I'm sure you recall all the deaths of nursing home uh, people, not the staff, but the people who were there to get nursing care. And uh, the good news was that we have improved on treatment. There are multiple treatment modalities now, antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, small molecule drugs, the Pfizer uh, protease inhibitor in combination with ritonavir, an HIV drug, has shown some excellent results providing treatment comes early in the course of the disease. You know, if you are five days symptomatic or less, then definitely, if you're experiencing those symptoms, get the drug. There is a disease in children, which is why kids should be vaccinated. And the vaccines going down to six months of age are coming pretty soon. But the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MIS-C, uh, has been rare, but it has been profound in the syndromes it causes in kids. Nowadays, most of those kids recover. So I think that the, the improvements in treatment have made a big difference. The first real innovation was using dexamethasone, which is a drug that is used for edema in the lungs, you know, fluid in the lungs. It's actually commonly used amongst hikers who hike above 14,000 feet in altitude because they often experience that type of edema. And that is an off-label use, but it certainly works. Anticoagulants also appear to be important. And you know, we've already heard reports of the uh, adenovirus vectored vaccines uh, giving rise in younger people, especially males, to uh, coagulopathies. What about the monoclonal antibodies? This is an area I do know something about. And they have shown decent activity initially. The uh, Lilly monoclonals don't appear to work well against some of the later variants, but Regeneron's looks good. And so does the monoclonal antibodies from AstraZeneca, which they licensed from a hero of mine, uh, Professor James Crow at Vanderbilt University. And we're still dealing with uh, long haulers. People who get infected uh, appear to uh, purge the infection somehow, but still be, are symptomatic. And what was interesting is something that I've been stating is that the, the long hauler syndromes appear to be the same, similar to, but not the same as chronic fatigue syndrome. And finally, somebody made that observation as well. I heard it on NPR, so I guess it must be true. Uh, Non-symptomatic or asymptomatic patients have also experienced something like uh, long hauler syndrome or medium COVID 
is another example of a term that's been used. But this is going to have, because so many people have been infected, this is going to have long-term consequences for healthcare around the world. So in terms of treatment, you know, I was asked recently, what are the three most important attributes of a drug? And I always like to say potency, potency, and potency. And let's throw in good pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics while we're at it. Uh, Remdesivir was uh, originally a Gilead drug and not developed and was not developed for Ebola, but showed activity in terms of reduction of mortality. It's a nucleoside analog, and I think we can do better in terms of potency with remdesivir, but it does have some activity in, in patients. And again, the sooner the treatment begins in the course of the disease, the better. Convalescent antiserum depends on their source. If they come out of uh, patients who recovered, who are uh, over 40 years of age, they appear to have better activity than if uh, you use convalescent antisera from a younger individual. Uh, it's not, they're not well standardized. And standardization of antisera uh, would be something useful, but the monoclonal antibodies in development and they're still in development because they're only being used using an emergency use authorization. That's not a drug approval. Uh, the, the ones from Lilly were okay, but they don't work against the latter variants. The Regeneron does okay, even against some of the latter variants. And you know, we'll see. I think we can do better in terms of potency with the monoclonals as well. But there are many drugs in development. And I already mentioned uh, the Pfizer protease inhibitor, Merck also had a drug approval, an emergency use authorization. Uh, that is showing activity early in the course of the infection. So remember I mentioned convalescent antisera. This is not a new concept. And here I am showing three individuals, Emil von Behring, who got the brilliant idea, and it was brilliant, to uh, isolate pathogens, in his case, mostly bacteria, inject them into large animals like horses, and then use the antisera from the horses to treat infection. The man in the middle of the slide was uh, Paul Ehrlich, who in 1908, for his work in immunology, shared the Nobel Prize with uh, Ilya Mechnikov. And his contribution was taking von Behring's antisera, standardizing them, improving the purification technology to try and prevent something called serum sickness. Because obviously if we put horse serum into human beings, there can be some adverse consequences. And finally, the, the man all the way over on the right is, uh, does anyone recognize him in the audience? Yep, and his name at birth, I believe was Emanuel Goldenberg. He was born in Hungary and emigrated to the US at the age of seven. He was fluent in seven languages, was known for playing tough guys, usually criminals in motion pictures. But in 1940, he appeared in something called Dr. Ehrlich's Magic Bullet, which was a movie basically about medicinal chemistry, where he discovered with his team, and the major heavy lifting was done by uh, Hatsuhiro Mata, his Japanese postdoc, uh, to try and identify novel arsenical compounds that would work against syphilis. What was interesting was that was, I love that movie and I read the book. In the entire movie, uh, they did not mention once that Paul Ehrlich was Jewish. And what was also interesting, and it was controversial in 1940 to use the word syphilis, which was done several times in that motion picture. So my observation was that in 1940, it was worse to be a Jew than to have syphilis. I do have a bad attitude. So let us flash forward you know, from the beginning of the century to 1925. There was an outbreak of diphtheria caused by the bacterium I'm showing in the middle and bottom of the slide called Coronibacterium diphtheriae. And antisera 
were available to diphtheria, but the outbreak was in Nome, Alaska, pretty much the far west of Alaska. Uh, there were bush pilots who could fly, but usually uh, they were open cockpit, and this was a brutal winter. So a team of 20 mushers and 150 dogs covered the 674 miles in under eight days. And the two key mush mushers were Leonard Seppala and his lead dog, Togo, and Gunnar Kassen and his lead dog, Balto. And there you can see a picture in Central Park of a bronze statue of Balto. Don't forget the heartwarming Disney cartoon of the same name. And below is a picture I took in the Cleveland Museum of the real Balto encased. And what's funny is Balto was known as Jet Black, but over the years, uh, the uh, light has uh, changed him to kind of a mahogany color. Now, Kassen and Seppala were both in Alaska for various gold rushes in the Yukon, uh, in Canada, and you know, through the state of Alaska. They became mushers because they love working with dogs. And uh, they took up the challenge of doing this relay with the 18 of their colleagues. Every year, this great race of mercy is commemorated in the Iditarod dog sled race. That's why that race is held. And they try and cover the same ground, but uh, it's been increasingly hard in this uh, era of uh, global warming. Uh, so you need a certain amount of snow, especially to get across uh, you know, frozen lakes and uh, rivers. The other thing I like to point out about uh, Kassen and Seppala uh, were that they were undocumented Norwegian immigrants and immigrants can save lives. And these certainly did. Balto was the final stretch lead dog and Kassen handed the ampules to, of the anti sera to Dr. Curtis Welch who within a day injected just about everybody he can get a hold of and the outbreak of diphtheria ended forthwith. So there are monoclonal antibodies, which is, you can tell, a favorite subject of mine, which are now full, of fully human origin or fully human sequence. So they don't have the issues of serum sickness. Palavishamab uh, came from uh, my company, my former company, Metamune. And indeed, uh, my wife, Miriana Nesson, worked on this as an investigator uh, because this is used primarily in premature or high risk infants uh, to prevent respiratory syncytial virus. It doesn't work as a treatment. And it has become a blockbuster. The good news is there's actually a better monoclonal that's behind it called Nercevimab, which has completed phase three clinical trials with spectacular results. And I'm proud of my team for actually doing that. Bezlotoximab is uh, for the prevention of Clostidium, Clostidium difficile diarrhea relapse. So you can get treated with antibiotics, uh, clear up the infection, but then relapse is something that occurs in a significant percentage of the patients. And again, that's caused by a bacterium and Bezlotoximab target something called TCDB, which is a bacterial toxin. And there are two monoclonals that are used for bacillus anthraxis. Uh, can't really do a clinical trial for that. It's relatively rare. Uh, it is considered a potential uh, pathogen of uh, bioterrorism. Uh, both of these antibody, uh, monoclonals were approved by something called the animal rule, meaning in animal models of disease, these monoclonals were tested and shown to be effective at both prevention and treatment. Ebola. So pointed out, remdesivir doesn't work in treating Ebola, which is what it was supposedly originally designed for. There are two monoclonal antibody approaches, that uh, one from Regeneron and the other from the Vaccine Research Center at the NIH. I want you to remember that. Mortality was 65 to 80% in untreated patients or you know, with alternate therapies. But using either of these early results in pretty solid efficacy. And in fact, MAB114 
is probably the standard of care for Ebola right now. And this was a large collaboration between Inovio, biotech outside of Philadelphia, USAMRID, AstraZeneca, my former group, and was derived from human B cells. The deputy director of the Vaccine Research Center, Barney Graham, obtained B cells from a patient who survived an outbreak of Ebola back in 1995. No, and why do I use this example? Well, Barney recently retired. He stayed on over a year at the NIH uh, because of the, Ebola, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 outbreaks, plural. Uh, righteousness, righteousness, thou shalt pursue uh, was in the Old Testament. Some read it as justice, justice you shall pursue. But uh, the one thing that I know that's righteous is prevention. And there's no better way of preventing a disease than a good, solid, efficacious vaccine. And they say, it. now a word from a higher authority. This is on the sign in front of uh, a church on the west side of Manhattan. And some, there are some non-evil people on the west side of Manhattan. Get thee vaccinated. If you haven't been vaccinated, uh, don't be silly. So the original guidance that the FDA submitted for the prevention of COVID-2, and you can easily access the guidance through the FDA website, is that the usual procedure is to issue a draft guidance to allow outside input. But this time the FDA tried, and I misspelled tried, that's okay, I'm dyslexic, to get their input up front and issue a final guidance. Target efficacy was based on 50%. Why is that? Well, interestingly, there are uh, coronavirus diseases in pigs, and a vaccine was produced that worked in pigs to the tune of 50%. So the rationale was that that could well be the, uh, the target that we could hit with a vaccine. You don't wanna make it impossible for vaccine developers to actually hit their marks for efficacy. Well, why 50%? I, I just explained to you the core sign coronavirus vaccines at best, they're 60% effective at preventing disease. The reason why there's interest in that is we have in the US, especially in Arkansas, these very large uh, pig breeding facilities where they're really in close quarters and they transmit disease, especially uh, if it's respiratory spread very quickly. So that was the rationale for developing those vaccines for pigs. So this is, this is a quote that is often attributed to Benjamin Disraeli, but he actually did not say that. This came from Mark Twain or Samuel Langhorne Clemens. There really is data manipulation, which we call cooking the books, but statistical analyses can actually reveal the truth. So statistics can reveal what's actually happening. And as I state here, I'm a classically trained statistician. So the original efficacy for both the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines was in the range of 95%, which is spectacular. They're not as effective today as they were when initially rolled out. But remember, we haven't fine-tuned these vaccines to also uh, deal with the new variants. Frankly, Moderna claims that they can encode up to 30 different antigens and there's a single mRNA vaccine candidate. So, you know, I think that the NIH already has been testing uh, you know, multivalent versions of the mRNA vaccines. And that could very well be what we're going to see as a booster coming into the future. The mRNA vaccine is, was done in collaboration with the NIH Vaccine Research Center. Remember I used the name Marty Barney Graham, also Kismekia Corbett, and we also should include John Mascola, who's the director of the Vaccine Research Center. 
They began the work early in January 2020. In fact, you can go to the BBC where Barney was actually interviewed and he described the timelines in great detail on the BBC. It's strange to me that it was never really heard here in the US. And notice at the bottom, I'm asking what an Operation Warp Speed, this much ballyhooed project from the Trump administration have to do with the development of these vaccine candidates. Well, if you listen to Barney, he'll tell you with respect to Moderna, all this work was initiated as soon as the sequence from Wuhan became available. So they didn't waste any time and they didn't ask for any more resources. Warp speed had nothing to do with the Pfizer-BioNTech mRNA vaccine. And how can I say that? Well, the head of Pfizer, uh, Albert Borla, basically stated as much both on television and on the radio. I, I will tell you that warp speed did do something good, which is rare for me to admit that anything good came out of the Trump administration. So uh, the Janssen J&J &J vaccine is quote, 70% effective, it's far less effective against the variants. And there was actually data shown that a second dose is probably required to get a full effect. Uh, it's just announced that uh, because of the, the coagulopathies being seen in certain younger patients, uh, its use should be restricted. The AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, two doses are better than one. Sputnik V, which was also ballyhooed by a no less an evil person than Vladimir Putin, bragging that his daughter was vaccinated with this, is not showing much, getting much love. And the suspect, the suspicion is that because the adenovirus vectors used in Sputnik V, which is actually two separate vaccines, are not inactive in replicating in humans, that we're seeing adverse events. And that's why the Russians have not embraced this vaccine. There are turkeys out there, Sinopharm, uh, Coronavac, which is a, more of a classic type of inactivated vaccine, you know, like the original uh, saw polio virus vaccine. The virus is isolated, it's inactivated chemically or thermally and then injected. And in some cases, this works great. Uh, in this case, uh, the Sinopharm Coronavac uh, vaccine was only about 50% effective in studies in Brazil. And the World Health Organization has already recommended three doses of this vaccine. CureVac is also an engineered mRNA and they only reported 40% efficacy. So I'm gonna assume that it's more a function of delivery of that vaccine than a function of mRNA failing in some cases and not others. Okay. So yes, there is a booster in your future. And probably another one. But in my opinion, you know, we might want to you know, mix and match, kind of like the Ken and Barbie in their wardrobes, using vaccines of different platforms, such as an AstraZeneca shot, followed by Novavax, which is a protein in lipid nanoparticles, and Novavax actually has good clinical data. Uh, their chief medical officer, Philip Lubavsky, is a good friend of our families. Philip knows what he's doing, especially with respect to vaccines. He should be concerned about variants. Uh, you bet. The Delta variant rapidly became over 95% of the cases. Then Omicron took over. BA2 called some cases uh, Omicron's little sister. Well, you can see that Omicron was giving us 800,000 cases a day. BA2 looks more like a blip than a spike, but we're gonna find out soon. You know, I'm guessing that it's going to fade into the background fairly quickly. It doesn't appear to cause more serious disease. It just appears to spread more rapidly. And those are two different things. Yeah, one thing I've always loved was the concept that people who were deficient in vitamin D get infectious diseases at a higher rate. So I 
reason, especially since I studied nutrition as an undergraduate at MIT, that maybe we just give people vitamin D supplements and see if that helps with respect to uh, dealing with an infection. And I say it to say, having looked at the data, uh, it doesn't work. It was tried very aggressively for tuberculosis because people reasoned, look, you know, we put people with tuberculosis in sanatoriums, not sanitariums, uh, so that they can get fresh air and sunlight. And indeed, you know, that seemed to work. So, you know, vitamin D actually occurs when, uh, you know, cholesterol in the skin is hit by sunlight and it's converted to 225 dihydroxy ergosterol, which is what vitamin D is. So I was hoping about that, it didn't work. So what went wrong here in the US? Why are we gonna have a million people die? And why don't I think it's necessary? Some experts say we probably could have saved 200,000 lives. I think it's probably closer to half a million. On January 19, 2017, the United States was considered to be the best prepared country to deal with the pandemic, not my words. We had a pandemic preparedness playbook that frankly, I helped prepare. We put together a team at the NSA, the National Security Administration, specifically to man manage a pandemic response. What happened on January 21st, 2017? The NSA team was fired. The playbook was literally thrown into the garbage, maybe even into Trump's toilet for all we know. I mean, what a colossal mistake. And let's talk about who was running the show. So former VP Mike Pence, who stated on the floor of the House of Representatives when he was a, a representative from Indiana, said evolution is just the theory. Before there was climate denial, there was and there still is evolution denial. So I'll tell you what a theory, what a, what a theory is. Gravity is a theory. Evolution is established scientific fact. And if you don't believe it, just watch what's happening with SARS-CoV-2. Now, who was running the show? The secretary of HHS, Alex Azar, was a pharma industry lobbyist from Eli Lilly, an Indiana company. No real expertise in health. Former Surgeon General, Dr. Jerome Adams. Yeah, how many people? knew he even was Surgeon General for four years now. He is also from Indiana and was appointed to his position in Indiana as head of their health department by Governor Mike Pence. Former head of the CDC, Dr. Robert Redfield, and I'm asking what did he ever do? He required no testing could occur outside of the CDC. This is probably the single largest error made in this whole early process. And some of the smart people were actually fired or forced out of their positions. Dr. Rick Bright, who was a respiratory virus expert, especially influenza, was forced out of his position as the head of the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. Nancy Messonnier, who had committed the unpardonable sin of actually speaking the truth in public, was fired from the CDC. And others were denigrated for speaking the truth like Dr. Deborah Burks, who was the coordinator in the White House, and Dr. Anthony Fauci, who we know is the head of uh, the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Disease. So is it any wonder that a team headed by Mike Pence, who doesn't believe in evolution, is going to be able to deal with a rapidly evolving virus? The answer is no, it's not. Warp speed, okay. I, I am going to say some nice things about this, but check out the timing. The vaccines that both BioNTech and Moderna had formatted were produced early during the course of the pandemic in the US in January of 2020. Even before that, we knew in the fall, probably around November, 
that there was something brewing in Wuhan. But the sequences were shared and within 36 hours, uh, Barney Graham's group had proposed the uh, production of an mRNA vaccine by Moderna. There are some great people who are involved in this. I'll tell you what Warpspeed did do, but remember Warpspeed didn't get started until May of 2020 when we were well into the pandemic and there was already exponential spread. So I, I like to maintain that we should call it uh, Operation Snail Speed. That being said, I'm gonna single out two people who did a great job as part of Warpspeed. Monsef Slaoui and Colonel Matthew Hepburn. Matt Hepburn uh, left his position at DARPA and Monsef Slaoui was at one time a head of vaccines for GlaxoSmithKline. These guys knew what they were doing and they knew that if they would pay upfront for doses of the vaccine, even before the clinical data was in, that they could stimulate large scale manufacturing. And that's precisely what they did do. So these, these two are real heroes. And I knew Matt Hepburn from his work at DARPA where we concluded a fairly large contract to assemble for DARPA a pandemic preparedness program. The goal there was to generate monoclonal antibodies against generally viruses, generally respiratory viruses, and to do it rapidly. And some of that work actually did lead to uh, Jim Crow's antibodies out of Vanderbilt. So uh, the good news was that the DARPA budget is buried somewhere in the Pentagon. And so uh, Donald Trump couldn't get his dirty little hands on. If he knew about it, he probably would have killed that program too. No, this is the punchline. When will the pandemic end? And the news flash is if you are vaccinated, and I have to add boosted, the pandemic is over. That you can basically live your lives. Now, right now we're having about 350 people a day in the US die. In an average flu season, that number would be 100 a day dying from flu. Now, people who are partially vaccinated are still getting infected and dying to the tune of about 42% of infected individuals. But if you've been vaccinated and boosted, that number drops to below 10%. So, and that's including the new variants. So as the sign said, get the vaccinated. And just watch those numbers. It's in the New York Times coming out of Johns Hopkins every day. When that number drops to the entire population to under 100 a day, then we can close the books on this. But one thing that the Biden administration did that was just plain wrong was declare victory around July 4th, 2021, only to see Delta emerge with a vengeance. And we already knew Delta was coming. You don't declare victory too soon. You want to stay vigilant. And as I'd like to say, now I'm going to give you another quote from, from my father. After I did uh, grand rounds at NYU Medical School, just after I completed my thesis work now 42 years ago, I invited my dad, who was an NYU graduate, to come. He did. I gave an hour talk, half an hour of questions. And he said to me afterwards, well, Dad, what do you think? Look, Steve, if you can't be good, at least be brief. <laughs> or as Yogi would say, if you don't go to their funeral, they won't go to yours. In inescapable logic, I think. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. I'll take any questions that you might have. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm just double checking the chat to see if there's anything. No, nothing on the chat right at the moment that's relevant. <clears throat> so any questions from the audience? And I have a mic, so oh, and Marlon's gonna help. This is probably overkill. That's a great talk, okay? And this is really important. I spent the last couple of years 
sitting in Southwest Wisconsin arguing with people on Facebook and you hit almost every topic that came up. I, I still haven't convinced most of my opponents, I have to say. So I'm afraid the county I'm about to retreat to is still at 59% vaccination. But I do have one minor thing. Uh, I don't know, you're about my age apparently, and you may remember the Fire Sign Theater. Oh, I love them, yeah. Okay, they also have Beat the Reaper. There's, uh, a, they do a, a, a quiz show called Beat the Reaper. I remember see? that, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, see, but, I thought. But yeah, no, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll make sure I include that as Thank well. Thank you. Uh, uh, George Carlin's routine came from uh, what he, perceived uh, would be uh, reality TV shows, which didn't exist at the time. He came up with this routine. Um, and he also had names for contraceptives, which were also very interesting. He's one of my favorite comedians. Embryo, that is correct. Mom bomb, yeah. Pregnant, yeah. <laughs> so thanks a lot for this excellent presentation. I actually had a question about uh, Novavax, since you mentioned already. So uh, Novavax was based on a, on a technology that was known before, right? It was some of the vaccines, like Hep B vaccines, protein-based vaccines. So I was wondering why, why it took them so long? Uh, because uh, if that vaccine was the first one to come up, I have an impression that the reluctancy, vaccine reluctancy made some, I mean, one of the arguments for vaccine like, rockets was, okay, but this is completely new technology. Why, you know, it's, it sounded like something is being, you know, forcefully introduced. While it, if it was a Novavax, you could always have this argument, okay, but we already had this. Yeah, Novavax, I believe, had a hiccup in that I think that Emergent was supposed to be manufacturing it for them. And Emergent, um, had a lousy inspection from the Food and Drug Administration. So I think that probably set them back. Now, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I know that Emergent did have a fairly large contract from the, uh, the US government to make the stuff, but then they essentially got shut down. So I think that was an issue that, that Novavax had. Uh, you're right, I think that's, that was a more proven technology. They've got a more, more experience, but as I like to point out, people said, how can you trust this vaccine? And, you know, it was discovered so fast. And you know, the, the NIH Vaccine Research Center has been working on coronavirus vaccines for nearly 20 years. So it's actually over 20 years right now from the initial SARS uh, outbreak. So uh, yeah, it's nice to know that 20 years of dedicated research uh, gave rise to an overnight success. Thank you. So I just bought a question, your lab leak is total bullshit comment, um, particularly in light of sort of Peter Daszak's role. First, uh, you know, his proposal to DARPA to put the Furin site in, which was rejected, then funded by NIH, and then in some ways his dishonesty, right? The fact that he did not, you know, you began your talk ethically revealing all of your involvement, he was the only representative from the US on WHO and had this deep collaboration with Wuhan. Well, and the NIH actually funded work in that self same in, laboratory. Right, but they funded it through Dazzle. Right. So the only, the only observation I'll make is uh, what did they do in Wuhan? They didn't burn down the laboratory. They burned down the wet market where they thought it came from. I think that's a good indication that they knew exactly where it was coming from. And if it was a lab leak, you wouldn't have had this type of explosive outbreak. It really had to be circulating for quite a while and not coming from a single individual walking out of a laboratory with a relatively small amount of virus. They've never found the animal link, right? There's not been, I mean- and, This, is, this you know, is quite true, although for, very similar sequences have been found in bats. And, and this, this funny looking animal called a penguin. Right. And people have, you know, uh, 
concern I have about virologists as a group is they've been putting furin and they've been, um, you know, despite the recommendations of the National Academy not to do gain of function with pathogens, right? So they've been doing it. And it seems to me one of the lessons we should take for this is whether it caused this outbreak, gain of function in pathogens in a BSL-2 lab just shouldn't happen. I agree with that. And I never proposed to do a gain of function experiment. No. There is a question on the chat. Um, Oh, it's not a science question. It's just that it, this, this recording will be made available. Yes, it's the answer to the question. So, <laughs> sorry, I guess I should have honored that question as well. All right, thank you for this talk. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a York College student and this is wonderful access to incredible science. W one of the uh, unfortunate things that occurred in 2020, a lot, have, a lot of people passed away and I, I you know, it's, it's sad. And I, I wonder if there's also an approach for a natural preventive, um, you, you spoke of nutritional um, strategies. Could that be like the seven natural doctors or the old school method that a thousand years ago, people were using these type of herbs and all these other sciences that during this pandemic was shunned, I would say, especially in communities of Caribbean or South American. I'm Ecuadorian. So my family came here in the 60s and to counter some of the changes in our environment, we did the ginger, garlic, all of this stuff on a daily basis. But when this occurred in 2020 and I started back in school here, I was, you know, I'm part of the not vaccinated group just to share that as well. And not because I don't believe in science, but because I have other practices that I've been doing for a few years. Now, well, I, we, I would still urge you to get vaccinated and you. continue with your practices. Yeah, 100%. Now, because I'm also a parent, do you, so you're going to take that position and the natural science, should that all, I mean, that's going to be both of them. So vaccinated and continue a, a preventive medicine or preventive strategy is the best yeah. way. So drug discovery is, is not an easy thing. Uh, but I will relate one story. Uh, there was a uh, traditional Chinese medicine drug called artemisinin, which is used now in combination with lumefantrine to treat malaria. And it works beautifully. And this was done at, at Novartis. I'm very proud to uh, be involved in the company that produced uh, this anti-malarial medication, which is the standard of care. So I do believe in both natural products and traditional medicine practices. Uh, I just think we have to really do a good job to understand the mechanism of what those naturally derived products actually do. And when we do, as in the case of the coartem combination from the Lourdes, we can actually do better than the traditional medicine. So, uh, no, look, I believe in healing. I believe in trying to stay fit, good nutrition. Um, and I also do believe in restaurants. Yeah. I, I learned how to grow sprouts. <laughs> Any other questions? <clears throat> the big pole in the way, sorry. So I agree with the students over there with some of what you said, but my husband and I and our two children are fully vaxxed and my husband and daughter and I also got our first booster shot late last year. I'm waiting to get the second one next month. And um, on Saturday, he called me from the street to see if I needed anything. And I said, you sound like you are getting a cold or something. And he said, I actually think I'm coming down with COVID. And he went and got tested and sure enough, he had COVID, he tested positive. His symptoms were fairly mild, but being from the Caribbean, I started giving him everything I could think of that is good, for, is known to be quote unquote good for colds. Uh, whole lemon in, in 
warm water and um, all kinds of different things that I grew up being, you know, given when I was sick. P.S. He's now asymptomatic. Were it not for the fact that he now needs to quarantine, he could have gone back to work. But had he not been vaccinated and at least once boosted, it could have been a different story. And so I believe in both. And like you, I would suggest for everyone who is not vaccinated and boosted to do that because this is my experience that it works. Yeah, just a quick comment. So I've gotten two doses of Moderna, also a dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine, and then the Moderna booster. And I would say a close family member with whom I routinely swap air did test positive and after being mildly symptomatic, and I've never tested positive. So, you know, good healthy immune system, uh, even in a 69.8 year old guy, somewhat overweight, uh, not as much as before, uh, I think goes a long way to preventing serious disease. Uh, there are two questions. Um, one, one of the things with uh, viral vaccines, as you know, has worked is inactivated viral vaccines. And there were quite a few on trial. And I haven't followed up, have you, how they're doing around the world? Well, the, um, let's see. The inactivated vaccine was uh, the CoronaVac from Sinopharm. And that didn't do so well. And the WHO recommended even before uh, the uh, Omicron outbreak, uh, three shots. Now, I don't know if that will improve its efficacy, uh, but you know that's a more classic vaccine than an activated virus. Uh, you know, that being said, you know there are other multitudes of approaches that are being tried, and as I said, I think Novavax has got, gotten pretty good data. That they're lipid encapsulated, the uh, purified spike protein. Uh, that's not as flexible a platform as the Moderna or Pfizer platforms, but it's much less expensive. And the AstraZeneca vaccine is actually a one tenth price of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. So that's really what's going to vaccinate most of the world. Yeah, the other question is obviously if your involvement with how to deal with pandemics. Uh, in 2016, 2017, we know about the document. But uh, uh, looking at this now, if you had to make one for uh, next pandemic coming 100 years from now, what are the things you recommend which you would not have thought about before? Well, the, the fastest thing is turnaround time. And um, I, I want to underscore the, uh, I'm called the, the Redfield error. And what so Robert Redfield was head of the CDC, and he insisted that all testing be done not in hospital laboratories, which are perfectly capable of running polymerase chain reactions, uh, but all samples be sent to the CDC, which incredibly slowed down the process. We know that RNA, and this is an RNA virus, is very unstable. So the possibilities of false negatives was very high. And when Redfield was asked, why did you do that? And his answer was very simple. He said that he was instructed to keep the numbers low. I don't know what else you can say about it. Uh, as I walk over to Emmanuel, we'll just take the last couple of questions here. There's one on the chat, um, which is uh, if you can uh, talk about the Global Pandemic and Biodefense Center. Uh, apparently, this is a Beat the Reaper uh, effort. I cannot discuss that. Okay. <laughs> In which case, I'll ask the other chat question on my walkover. Uh, to what degree can the research behind the current vaccines protect us against other dangerous viruses? Uh, for example, Marburg? Yeah, so Marburg is kind of related to Ebola. Uh, and, you know, it's much more difficult to transmit. It's not really respiratory. Uh, but, you know, I think we already have developed uh, 
some Ebola vaccines that look like they're fairly effective. But the beauty of the mRNA platform is, as I said, it's plug and play. Once you have the sequence and you can get the viral sequence in like 45 minutes in the laboratory, uh, then you know, I think you're good to go. We can try a variety of formats. The adenovirus vector vaccines um, also seem to have pretty good activity. Uh, but you know, in the case of Marburg, you don't have to vaccinate a lot of people because the outbreaks are fast and furious, but they don't spread very much because people are just too sick. So, uh, but you know, that's why uh, there's a, a group that I'm involved with called the Head 100, which is to literally prepare monoclonal antibodies against 100 uh, pathogens of, we'll call them of interest. And this is a combination of you know, biodefense work and pandemic preparedness, that we should have stuff on the shelf, good to go, before we have to deal with the next pandemic. So I have actually I have two questions. The first one is, um, you know, you mentioned a number of times the uh, loss of weight during the pandemic, as well as the um, accessibility to restaurants. I wonder if there's been a causative, you know, link between those two things. And if there's any studies to, uh, to to follow up on that. Yeah, I first of all, I'm going to attribute the weight loss to uh, walking around Central Park every morning for about a little over two hours. And uh, a lot of these pictures I took, and now the gym's back open in, in our building in Manhattan. Uh, so I've been really disciplined about working out uh, just about every day. Uh, but yes, the, the lack of uh, restaurant attendance certainly played a key role in my weight loss. And, and the other question uh, more seriously is, it, this wasn't really the, the point of your talk, but uh, in terms of uh, the, the MISC, right, what, have there been inroads into uh, uh, prevention and treatment, um, or is it treated very much as like Kawasaki, or is there a different approach? Yeah, so Kawasaki syndrome is uh, another unusual disease of somewhat unknown etiology. So, uh, which, you know, we can see in kids. Uh, No, no there a lot of a lot of theories. The same with people try to identify viral origins of chronic fatigue syndrome as well, and you know, uh, without much real success. Uh, there has been some junk science published about it, but you know that was about it. Uh, you know, I think MISC or MISC uh, is kind of a conundrum. It's not obvious that otherwise healthy children who get infections, develop this, you know, inflammatory syndrome. Uh, and, you know, I think that indeed, you know, if a kid becomes symptomatic, uh, I wouldn't hesitate to use a monoclonal antibody to see if uh, you can shorten the course of the infection. Uh, I know that steroids have been used in these kids, but I don't see, I, I have not seen any real clinical efficacy data as far as that's concerned. I think the best approach is to vaccinate all the kids too. And if it sounds like I'm pro-vaccine, I'm pro All right, well, thank you, Steve, again for a wonderful talk. Yeah. And thanks to the people on the Zoom call for putting up with me. Yeah. Uh, in closing, I'd, I'd like to invite up uh, Dr. David Spurgel, uh, Marty Spurgel's son for some, some comments, and then we'll retire to the other side here for a reception. Sure. So I just want to begin by thanking for a really terrific talk. It was really, a, and it's a, a, a talk that for many reasons, I wish my father was here to hear. I know he would uh, have enjoyed it. Uh, he was, you know, really proud of his time at York. Uh, it was an important place for him, uh, really valued the York community. And I am, you know, one of the things that he was involved with when he was the uh, head of natural sciences was uh, bringing the FDA facility here and building up the pharmaceutical sciences program. And uh, I think we'd be thrilled that his lecture series included this. Um, he was able to attend 
um, the previous lectures. Uh, and uh, the last one, it was, um, you know, he had Lewy body dementia, so it was difficult for the, the, the last lecture, but uh, it was something he, he valued and enjoyed. And uh, when I set this up, um, I know that he was very pleased to have something established in perpetuity that would continue his connection with York and really provides the opportunity to bring outstanding scientists to York from the outs you know, outside community and, and celebrate that work and, uh, ex and provide uh, this for the community. So uh, thank you again. Uh, you know, thank you, Tim, for your organization and all of you for being here. It's great to, great to be here and uh, look forward to people's remarks and to joining everyone at the reception. Thank you. All right, so without further ado, uh, please join us on the other side of the, the wall here and we have some uh, uh, nice reception. And uh, after about 15 minutes or so, when folks have gotten some food, we'll uh, share some remarks. Uh, uh, about Marty, our good friend. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, I hope I hope you're all enjoying the food and the the, the talk was excellent and uh, that that was all appreciated. Um, being that this is the Marty Spurgel. Um, Memorial Lecture as well. Uh, I did want to open up the floor for folks uh, to share memories of Marty. And I'll start with myself. Um, there are some, some photos over here, if you haven't seen by the, by the memorial table. Uh, uh, and we keep these in our physics labs. Yeah. So this is Marty and his good friend, Frank Pamilla, founding faculty at York in physics. And uh, uh, they're working with some students on the Beacon Project, which uh, was very likely one of the first, if not the first federally funded uh, program in the United States to improve the diversity in STEM. Uh, it was funded by the NSF in 1968. So it had to be one of the first. Um, so Marty and, and Frank, an, an incredible team, and uh, I was uh, actually hired by Marty. Uh, he had a, a NASA grant. Jack, you were a co I on that, I think, right? Yeah. So thank you for writing that grant. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not only money. And I did explain this to Marty at some point, you know, that that grant ended up hiring me and changing you know, my entire life and our whole family. And my son was born in New York and he's a New Yorker. And you know, this, is, this is all because of, of what uh, Marty did that, that I'm actually able to, to stand here in front of you. I may not have even continued in astronomy. The market is challenging to say the least. And I was, I was pretty close uh, back then as a, as a struggling postdoc um, in what I called postdoc purgatory because you just go from one to the next with no future. It's really hard times. But um, uh, it was a very snowy day in April um, when I got to York's campus and um, you know, came from my interview and, and met Marty. And I had emailed him just a few days before. And I, just, and I tell this story to students too. And I just asked him, um, what do I got to do to get this job? I really want it. What do I got to do? And he told me. You know? And then I made sure that that was really clear. Uh, if you want to know the answer, it was stress your work with students, which I did. I had done a whole bunch of works with undergrads and it was great. Um, so, you know, I, I knew York was a good fit for me and, and I had to make that clear. And I just asked him straight out. So I always appreciated that. And uh, all of his guidance over the years while he was chair and even after he was chair for a while. And when I became chair and, you know, when he told me it was, uh, it's a lot of work, but it, it can really be worth it. Uh, it. It's very satisfying. I definitely remember him saying that. So, um, you know, the opportunity to, to, to have an excuse to have him come back to campus frequently for, you know, this lecture series was, was really a, a, a joy personally because I love to, to see him and uh, to chat with him as frequently as I could. So, um, uh, 
Uh, I, I owe much of everything uh, in my career to Marty, really. It's, 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 it's no exaggeration. Uh, and very much appreciate everything he, that he did for me uh, and my family and, and, and everything. And if you look at what I have done in my career, um, especially following in his footsteps with Beacon, I run a program called Astrocom NYC. And we've had almost 60 students go through this program CUNY wide. Uh, and many of them are in grad school now studying astrophysics. And, you know, he, he was just tickled by that, that whole thing. So um, that's been going 10 years strong. And, uh, you know, he was there the, helping me write my first big proposal. It was a NASA proposal. So, um, uh, you know, all, all, all of this is, has been possible because of uh, Marty paving the way. So really appreciate him, miss him. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that you're all here to share uh, with us today. So thanks. Thank you very much. And if anybody else would like to say some words about Marty, um, uh, that's great. And I have, uh, I have the mic. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dan Roby. And uh, I feel like we ought to explain something that may not be obvious to everybody. <clears throat> When Marty hired me about the same time Tim started here. So that was in 2001. Yeah. It was the first week of my time at York that the World Trade Center was attacked. Uh, that was traumatic. Anyway, uh, I want to say that at that time, all of the many departments, what, what are now separate departments of biology and chemistry and physics and earth sciences, we were all one giant natural sciences department. So <clears throat> Marty was the chair, in a sense, he was the chair of biology and physics and chemistry, um, although we had discipline coordinators. Anyway, it was a kind of different structure, which was preparing the way for the division into three departments with the structure that we now have. So although Marty was a physics professor and I'm a chemistry professor, he was the chair, my chair for quite a while, for several years. And I think now I am the person in the chemistry department who's been there the longest and is still active. And uh, I am probably the last person, I may be the last person that had Marty as chair. I'm not, uh, well, Emmanuel and Fernley aren't here to say. But uh, anyway, so I also remember the day I came over to give a talk uh, about the research I'd been working on, and it fit in really well from Marty because it was about spectroscopy of hydrogen molecules. And this is a critical issue in planetary astronomy. That was the main application of laboratory work I was interested in. And he figured out what I was saying almost immediately. And uh, I felt very welcomed uh, with a topic which had mainly astronomical applications rather than chemistry applications that you'd think would happen in the chemistry department. So Marty was my chair for several years and we worked pretty well together, I have to say. I never wrote a proposal with him, uh, to my regret, but that would have been great. And uh, it's been good for the last several years to be able to see Marty once a year or so. There's still equipment with that I see that I know dates back to the time when he was uh, doing things like this. That we make it still work. We still got books. Uh, I, I accumulate books from leaving prof departing professors. I have stuff from Frank Pamela, for instance. And uh, so I'm going to be sorry not to be running into him around here anymore. Does anybody else have? My name is Jack Schlein. These two guys who spoke before me, they're newbies. I came in 1971. 
I, I was a child prodigy. That's my line. That's my line, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> Marty was my chair for 19 years, the full 19 years. Uh, obviously, I was in biology, and he was a physicist, but he was the most gentle, kind-hearted chair. I mean, it was not really like having a boss. It was like having an almost father-like figure. He was a terrific guy. Uh, he introduced me and my family to Vermont. A little known fact is we actually rented his house in Vermont and was it Powder, Powder Ridge? Yeah. And later on, a friend of Powder Mill. That's right, Powder Mill. Uh, so he was a terrific guy. He was um, a wonderful chair, a kind, gentle soul. I never heard him raise his voice in 19 years of being my chair. Um, and so I am deeply grateful for all the factors along the way that helped me. Um, he and Frank, Frank Miller actually got me into the business of uh, uh, science for children, for science for school-age kids. And uh, that led eventually to SEMA, which Maz and Tim start, took over from me eventually. And now I think there are 20,000 kids out there that have been through uh, SEMA. So uh, it was a wonderful experience having him as a chair. And I do miss him as well. Thanks to your family. Yeah, newbie. Yeah, I forget. I think it was. Oh, it was Marty's retirement dinner, and uh, and Dooley, Dooley Jane had gotten up, and he said, you know, Marty was hired and came in with Frank, and then a year later, Gene. Levin was hired, and then another year later, Sam Borenstein was hired, and then I was hired, and I was the junior faculty until this guy was hired, and he pointed at me. <laughs> Dooley Jane looked like he was 100, you know, so <laughs> he always looked like he was 100. And Marty found that hilarious because um, he had a, an amazing sense of humor, and that's one thing I definitely miss hearing throughout the halls was his big, he had this big throaty laugh, um, which he used all the time. Um, David, did you? Well, I would you know, want to give some, since it's the college's 55th anniversary, I realized, and my mother may, who's on, may correct me, because I was six at the time, but I remember when my dad came home with the York College offer, and my mother got ice cream cake out of the refrigerator. We didn't have desserts like that that often. So I'm pretty sure there was an ice cream cake associated with his starting work. And then as junior faculty, um, I remember when he struggled to get tenure and we were going to move to Hartford, Connecticut. He was upset about this, he got a dog. And then fortunately he got to stay. And you know, as people mentioned, he was department chair for 19 years. He was not just like a father figure for me. <laughs> for my siblings, my, my brother, my sister, and I, he, you know, he was a terrific father figure. And the warmth that people remember was certainly what he was like as a father. And, uh, you know, certainly for me in particular, you know, he was very much a role model. My own career uh, has been in physics. You know, I've had a pretty successful career that my dad really helped launch. And then in my, now in my later years, um, I have a career in science administration. And uh, again, I think uh, my father um, you know, was able to tell him as this, uh, in his final years, the transition I was making. And I know something that uh, he enjoyed very much when he was at York was the breadth of science he was exposed to. I mean, the fact that he was interacting with the biologists and the chemists and geologists, and 
if, if my memory is right, I believe also nursing, that uh, all of that was under uh, National School of Natural Sciences. Right, the whole, right, the whole health professions thing, yeah. Technology, all of that was under natural sciences. And uh, he, you know, really enjoyed the being part of and helping to build the college across all that. You know, I know uh, one of the many ways in which he will live on um, is through the contributions to now the many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of students who have graduated York in its 55 years. Uh, and uh, science programs have touched many of them, launched many successful careers, as I mentioned earlier, but, uh, you know, he was proud of his role in helping working to build the FDA program here. And you know, today's talk would be exciting to see uh, the, the connections that, that that program has with, uh, with this uh, pandemic. He, he actually got COVID in March. He was an early, always was an early adopter in March 20. So always at the cutting edge. Thankfully, uh, for I guess then a 82 uh, year old had a fairly mild case of COVID, you know, and um, I, I have a suspicion, but I don't want to do the experiment because I've been boosted four times, that we actually have a reasonably good uh, genetic uh, uh, genes for COVID survival. This is based primarily on my youngest son, who is at Princeton, where there is a 70% COVID rate. And my youngest son is the chief bartender in his fraternity, which is, a, so he spends his time, I believe mostly massless, I'm pretty sure mostly massless, behind the bar um, in an underground basement serving people. And he tests regularly and has never had COVID. So I, I think, you know, one of the many things we may have gotten from my father. <laughs> Met one of many, one of many. So, uh, I mean, if anyone else has something, we'll be turning it over, but uh, not, not up to him. I, thank you all for coming. Great. Well, um, th thanks again. There's still more food, um, still more conversation. Uh, please enjoy. And uh, uh, I should say it was really a nice, uh, one nice thing, uh, being at your father's uh, at the burial was to meet the rest of your family. Who I'd, I'd met your wife before, but not all the siblings. And your brother, I think it's your brother. If, if, if any of you have not met David's brother, oh, and there's, oh, thank you. <laughs> there's also uh, goodies in the back there. There's some York paraphernalia. So please, please help yourself to that. But, um, if, if anyone's not met David's brother, just go ahead and look at the picture of Marty over here. Sorry, it's, 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 his, it's his brother, it's amazing. I was really surprised. They have very different voices, but um, <laughs> it's a fitting image.
Oh, thanks a lot. And Steve, thanks again for coming to campus. It's been great uh, to have you here.